Well, hello, virtual Southern Fried Gaming Expo attendees, and welcome to the Arcade Repair Tips Seminar. Of course, my name, guys, is Jonathan Leung, and I am joined by Mr. Arcade Repair Tips himself, Tim Peterson. Tim, how are you? I'm fine, John. It's uh, be glad when we can be in the same studio together. We're still social distancing, but uh, wish we were at the Southern Fried Grain Room Expo together. I'm with you. I wish we were too, but Tim, I guess this is the next best thing. Uh, typically, guys, we would do a seminar at the Southern Fried Gaming Expo, but uh, obviously they allowed us, Tim, this time to do a virtual seminar, which is basically the exact same thing we'd be doing as if we were in the room with everybody, but we're just doing it in a different setting. So again, we're socially distancing, as you can see, but um, we hope that you guys are all safe and that you are social distancing as well and uh, doing your best to be safe so uh, but thank you guys for watching we're gonna be doing a couple of questions that we got from our audience so we'll be talking about those and we'll also be posting a very or posing a very special question uh, at the end of the show Tim that I think you're really gonna like so now for those of you guys who may not be familiar with arcade repair tips let's tell you a little bit about ourselves arcade repair tips is a website that's devoted to arcade repair as as the name implies uh, me and Tim have been doing this since May of 2008 and uh, it's really been a fun journey for us to uh, help other people fix their games, which is what the whole point of the website is. If you haven't been to our website, it's arcaderepairtips.com. We highly encourage you to go there. We have a YouTube channel as well, and you can visit that at youtube.arcaderepairtips.com. But Tim, I'm going to put a little bit of history stuff up here just so people know. So in 2001, Tim, you and me met while well, you were shopping for a computer, right? Right. So um, Tim came in. I was working at a local electronic shop, and Tim, Tim came in looking for a computer. And uh, by the time we <laughs> we were done, I sold you a computer and invited myself over to your house because you said you had arcade games. And so um, in 2001, we met. And then in 2002, um, we embarked on building a MAME cabinet, Tim. And that's kind of one of the projects we were really excited about at the time. Um, Tim, in 2002, MAME cabinets were a fairly new idea. There weren't a whole lot of them out there. And so um, I did not know the arcade part of it. You did not know the computer part of it. It. And so between the two of us, we were able to put together a main machine and I uh, thought it turned out really well. And we put together a website called Tim's Main Machine webpage, which had our documentation on how we did it. And then, Tim, yeah. we transitioned that website to our, Tim's Arcade Restoration because we didn't just do MAME cabinets anymore. We did arcade restoration as well. So we kind of expanded into that. And then in 2005, Tim, we actually found our own operator company called Varcade Entertainment, which we still have, and uh, we started out just doing local arcade routes, but then we moved into larger venues and things. In 2007, Tim, we actually got a contract for a very large restaurant that had 40 plus games, correct? Yeah, we had games everywhere in that place. Exactly. It was great, um, but Tim, just a year later, they closed. And we were doing great, but the restaurant itself didn't do so well. And so um, at that point, we we kind of uh, ceased our operating of games just because, um, you know, it was tough. To, it was it took up a lot of time, right, Tim? Yeah, it was very time consuming. We worked. Uh, every off day, just all the time. <laughs> right, and for people who aren't familiar with operating games, basically what that is is where you buy games and then you put them out on location at various locations and you split the profits with the location owners. So if it's a restaurant or maybe we had some Tim in video game stores and some other places. And so we did that for basically since 2005. So we did that for about a three-year period where we ran our own route. But Tim, a lot of people don't know that you've worked for Chuck E. Cheese or you worked for Chuck E. Cheese for a very long time. How many years did you work for Chuck E., Tim? 17 years. So, and during that time, you were primarily a game tech, correct? Yeah, most of the time I was strictly a game tech. And this is this is why Tim is Mr. Arcade Repair Tips, is because Tim has been around the block a couple of times on a lot of this stuff and has seen a lot of the issues that most of our audience experiences. But Tim, the most important date may be May 2008, where we founded Arcade Repair Tips, and ever since that day, we've been putting out content related to arcade repair. And Tim, of course, we've been around for 12 years now, which is hard to believe. Uh, it seems like just yesterday we started this thing. Of course, uh, when we started this thing, I didn't have kids, so that's a lot of that's a lot of time that's gone by. Um, the operation expanded, Tim. Uh, when we started this up, it was just you and me, but now it's uh, you and me plus Eric and Rusty, who do the question and answer podcast, plus our social media managers, Mark and Louie, Correct. Yeah. So we have six people on Team Arcade Repair Tips now, and we, we want to thank Eric and Rusty and Mark and Louie because they're completely volunteer, right, Tim? We don't pay them anything, uh, but they do fantastic work at helping people uh, with arcade repair and also posting stories involving arcades, which we really appreciate. 
And Tim, we have yeah, over Tim. Fi- yeah we have over fifty five blog posts and YouTube videos on various aspects of coin operated repair, some pinball repair, some uh, arcade repair, just all sorts of different repair, just some generic repair, Tim, like how to how to connect broken wires back together, stuff like that. And then yeah. Tim, we've recorded over a hundred and ten question answer podcast and live show episodes answering questions from people just like you people who are watching this right now uh people who have arcade games and are wondering how they can get them back into shape tim that's what we do right yep and then we also have four dvds that we've released tim and you can buy those dvds at our store at arcade repair tips.com slash store um four volumes tim at some point we'll put out a fifth volume i'm not making any promises as to when but if you would like to get our dvd content make sure you sure you go to arcade repair tips.com slash store so tim did i cover all the bases is that everything that everybody needs to know about us no, i think so okay also, I'm probably familiar exactly hopefully hopefully you've seen our stuff before but we know a lot of you guys may be watching this feed because um you know maybe there's a board game seminar that that uh, you saw or something like that and maybe you want to get into owning your arcade games tim if you want to own an arcade game what do you need to know well you need to um you need to have a little bit of knowledge um but you know it just have fun you know that's the main thing these games were entertainment and they should be fun don't uh, you know, we're here to help you with the technical and the hard stuff and the get your game going, but just remember to have fun. Exactly. I mean, owning arcade games is great, but knowing how to repair them is very important, Tim, because we all know if somebody moves the game, more than likely they're going to have some trouble with it, right? Yep. If you're going to own a game, you're going to, you not need to learn how to fix them. Absolutely. Or you're going to be real broke. <laughs> there you go. So, Tim, before we get into the questions that we selected for the seminar, I do want to throw this disclaimer up here. And this is just so we can make sure that, uh, you know, you know that what we're telling you here, we're mainly doing this for entertainment purposes, but, you know, this is to inform you as well. But, you know, we're not responsible if you decide to do anything yourself. So um, just keep that in mind, Tim. We try to always present accurate and reliable information, correct? Yes. But, you know. But, uh, but- Lunch. Exactly, but um, but you know you do your own repairs at your own risk, right? Right. And so that's all that disclaimer says. We just like to throw that up there just so we don't get sued. So <laughs> there you go. But uh, Tim, we do have several questions here now. Tim, like we mentioned before, these are questions from people just like you who have bought arcade games and maybe they were working when they bought them and then all of a sudden they're not working anymore. Now, Tim, we selected some that are on the very base level of arcade repairs. So if you're just now getting into it, or maybe you've never even touched an arcade game to repair it this is just this is the seminar for you i promise because these questions are kind of on the easy end or what we would consider the beginner end of our skill level series so tim if you go to our website you will notice that we have our topics broken down by skill level so um, we have beginner we have intermediate we have advanced and we have expert and so if you are getting started in arcade repair you can go to our website and just look at the videos at your skill level you don't have to necessarily um, start at the advanced stuff Um, you can start the beginner go from there learn the parts of an arcade cabinet and some basic repairs then move your way up as you go so um, really helps out you guys who are just getting started that's the whole goal here of course is to ease you in to repairing your own arcade games tim did you have something i saw you put your hand up there and jonathan did you have did you mention that you archived all the previous questions so how many questions are there answers to of how to fix uh, stuff that's wrong with the games on our website. Right, so we have the question and answer database, and I believe there's over 1,800 questions and answers in the question and answer database at this point. So quite a few. So if you're looking for an answer to a question you may have about arcade repair, you may check the question and answer database first um, because we may have answered it in the past, and that is also on our website at arcaderepairtips.com. So, Tim, are you about ready to ease into these questions real quick? Yeah, let's roll. Okay, let's roll. Let's do it. So the first one we have is from Lyndon, Tim. So I'm going to go ahead and put Lyndon's question up here. He says, hi, I am new to Arcade Repair, t- uh, Repair, Tim. Just a newbie question. How do I determine the make and model of my monitor chassis? Is there a code on the chassis? If I want to replace the monitor chassis, should I replace it with the same one? Thank you. Now, Tim, this is a very common question that we get all the time and is very, and very important here. Um, but, uh, you know, basically, if I'm trying to determine what my monitor chassis is, and for those of you guys who may not know what a monitor chassis is, the monitor chassis is the part that connects to your monitor tube. So when you're looking at your arcade game, there's a screen. On the back of that screen, which is the tube, there is a board, and that board connects to the tube, and we call it the monitor chassis or chassis. And we pronounce it both ways. I know people have uh, have 
sometimes made fun of us because we say chassis, but chassis is technically correct, and so is chassis. But uh, that board is the chassis, and that is the primary part that goes wrong with an arcade monitor. So typically when you're having problems with an arcade monitor, it's because something is wrong on the chassis. So Tim, how does one determine the make and model of a monitor chassis, and is there any code on the chassis they should be looking for? And if you, if you want to replace it with another monitor chassis, do you have to use the same one? Well, fortunately, there are a lot of monitors. Uh, of course, when you work on as much as we can, sometimes we can just tell by looking at them. They have telltale signs. Um, and we can use uh, our friend Bob Roberts has a site. I know you'll probably post that here in a second where you can go to and what's my monitor and look at other ones to determine what yours. Sometimes you get lucky. Sometimes they have a sticker on them or some it's stamped on there. Um, most of the time, though, those things fall off or wear off over time. Um, so some of it's just you're just a little bit of research. And of course, if you don't know, uh, take a picture of it, send it to us. And a lot of times we can help you with that. Absolutely, Tim. Uh, we can help you identify monitor chassis if you're having a hard time. But what Tim mentioned is absolutely correct. I mean, there usually is a sticker or something on the chassis that will tell you, um, you know, whatever make and model it is. But Tim, the thing about it is, is that some of the arcade games we're working on, like the Pac-Man and the Galaga behind me, are over 30 plus years old. And so in right. that amount of time, sometimes stickers fall off, right? Yeah, very often they do, especially with heat and temperatures, climate changes and stuff. Right, so you may not be able to find a sticker even if you're looking for one because it may have fallen off over time, which is why it's important to be able to identify a, a monitor chassis by the way it looks. And so let's go ahead and talk about that, Tim. Tim mentioned the, um, the What's My Monitor page on Bob Roberts' site, and I'm going to mention that here in a second. But before I do, Tim, let me go ahead and read the slide here. So sometimes the monitor chassis will have a sticker on it that will tell you the information you're looking for here, Lyndon. So unfortunately, like we mentioned, these stickers tend to fall off over time. You can always compare your chassis uh, which, with the pictures found on the What's My Monitor page on Bob Roberts' website if you can find a match. So Tim, Bob Roberts um, is a man who used to run a website called TheRealBobRoberts.net. Unfortunately, Bob is no longer selling parts, but he still has a ton of great information on his website, including how to repair a lot of different things. But one of the, the biggest pages that we like on Bob's site is the What's My Monitor page. So if you go to TheRealBobRoberts.net slash monitor.html, you will find a basically an entire listing of pretty much every common arcade monitor chassis that's out there and you can click on each one and see a picture of that chassis. So what you'll want to do is is look at your chassis and your game that you currently have and compare it to the pictures on that What's My Monitor page and see if you can find a match. Once you find a match, you'll know what the model and make is of your monitor chassis. So, I mean, it's not it's not terribly difficult, Tim. Um, Wells Garner is usually pretty good at about putting Wells Garner on the chassis somewhere. So, and that's one of the, the bigger manufacturers of arcade monitors. So here in the picture, you'll see I actually have a Wells Garner sticker there, Tim. Um, and those are very common to find. But like we mentioned, they may come off over time. If that's the case, then you can just compare your chassis to the What's My Monitor page and find out what it is. Now, again, the real BobRoberts.net slash monitor.html for those pictures. Now, Tim, uh, Lyndon's other question was, does he have to replace the chassis with the same one? What do you think, Tim? Well, you don't necessarily have to, but most of the time it won't work if you don't. I mean, there may be a few uh, exceptions, but yes, you need to replace it. Uh, because it's set up for that tube uh, and to work with that tube and so forth. So um, there are some universal chassis. There are some uh, other ways that it, it's not 100%. But for the most part, yes, you need to replace it with what's on there. Right, and so we put here in the slide, which I still have up, Tim, that it is best to replace your chassis with the same one if possible. Now, it may not be possible, Tim. Um, you can. There are some chassis that are that are interchangeable with each other, and it depends on the tube values, Tim. If the tube values are uh, similar, or the same between the yoke values are the similar, or the same between two tubes, 
then you can switch them. But uh, th like Tim mentioned, there is a universal chassis that you can buy now, and the universal chassis is compatible with most tubes. So if you're having a hard time repairing your chassis, you may look into getting a universal one. And Lyndon, if you need some additional help on on how to or where to get those universal chassis, we can give you a link to purchase those. But you can find them on eBay and, and AliExpress and some of the different websites out there. Tim, the universal ones are not great quality, but if you're in a pinch and you need to get a game up, it does it works pretty well, right? Yeah, they work. They are what they are. They're, but some of them work really good. So it depends on what kind of tube you have. Exactly, and so um, but the compatibility is pretty good with most of them. And Tim, we've had our um, one of our Facebook moderators, Mark, has actually uh, done it before and had pretty good success with it. We have not per personally used the Universal Chassis, Tim, but Mark had really good luck with them. Um, again, not as good as using the original chassis or repairing the original chassis if um, if that's if, if you want to go that route. But it is a good way to get a monitor up and running in a pinch. And Tim, if you're an operator, speaking from experience, we are always trying to get games up in a pinch, right? For sure, as quick as possible. Exactly. So um, Universal Chassis may not be a bad a bad idea if that's the way you want to go. Uh, Tim, anything else for Lyndon here before we move on to our next question? No, I think we've pretty much covered that one. Sounds good. And Tim, we should mention if he has trouble repairing his chassis or if he, if he can't find parts for it, whatever the case may be, uh, there are several people that we can recommend um, that you can send your chassis to that will give you monitor repair. And if you go to our website at arcaderepairtips.com and if you go to slash resources, that's our resources page. And Tim, we have an entire section on just monitor repair, people that you can send off your monitor chassis to to get it repaired. Because I know a lot of you out there may not be comfortable with um, repairing the chassis yourself or may not feel like you have the expertise to do that. If you don't feel comfortable doing it, d d no problem. Send it to somebody who does. They'll send it back to you. And Tim, the repair fees are, are not terrible for getting that done, correct? No, not, a, not really that bad at all. Right. Now, you still have to pull out the chassis, which can be a little nerve-wracking if you've never discharged a monitor before. And if you don't know what we're talking about, you should go watch our, our video on safely discharging an arcade monitor, right, Tim? Yes, been like we've shot plenty of videos dealing with that. And so if you do if you do that, then it'll show you how to discharge it. And it can be a little nerve wracking the first time you do it. I will tell a story where Tim actually had me stick a screwdriver up underneath an anode cup with the monitor still turned on. Uh, did I mention that, Tim? Um, I thought yeah. you told me it was off, but I can show you what not to do. Exactly that you don't do that. Make sure that the monitor is unplugged, the game is unplugged before you discharge the monitor. Um, otherwise, you'll get a really good wake up call. I promise. So, um, but hey, I'm still alive to talk about it, Tim. I'm still alive, right? So we're all good. Yeah. But uh, anyway, guys, just be careful when you're doing that. Anytime you're working with the chassis or the monitor, there is a lot of electricity going through there. So uh, just just be careful and you'll be fine. Unplug the game whenever you're doing your chassis work removal or installation and you'll be in good shape. But Lyndon, hopefully answers your question. And good luck identifying your monitor chassis. And if you have a monitor chassis that you need help identifying, guys, send us a picture of it to questions at arcaderepairtips.com. We'll be happy to help you with that identification. Okay, Tim, this next one is from Anne. And again, this is one that we get fairly often about several different arcade games. So let's go ahead and work into Anne's question real quick. And she says, hi, I have a Galaxian arcade game. I can hear the high voltage of the monitor, but the game does not start and the monitor shows no image. Any ideas on how to fix this problem? Thank you. So Tim, um, Anne's got a Galaxian here, and she can hear the high pitch, high voltage squeal, which is pretty common to let you know that the monitor is getting power, correct? Right. But the the game is not starting up. There's no picture on the monitor. So how does Anne start troubleshooting this problem? What are some of the steps that you would recommend Anne walk through in order to figure out what's going on with her Galaxian? Well, we like to say we love the ASAP approach. And that's not as soon as possible. It's always start at power. So what we want to do is check the power from the wall all the way through the power cord, all the way through the power supply, and on to the, where it plugs into the game board to make sure that we have good power all the way around. Uh, you want to check that we uh, have several videos on how to check a power supply, how to check a classic power supply in case it's a classic game like Galaxian. Or, uh, but, but somewhere down the line, there's something going on. The board 
is not getting the correct voltage or it's not, you know, we're getting nothing on the screen or she's got a definite board problem if all the voltages are correct and still nothing is going on, you're going to need to get her board repaired. But this is one way that we like to use all the time when we prepare games. First thing we do is we start at power and we go through the power of the game from where it enters to where it switches from AC to DC voltage. Sorry about the dogs. We're shooting live, of course, at home. Um, but anyway, that's some good areas to at least start in, and then we can kind of go from there. Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and put up the slide, Tim, since uh, you talked about it. But based on your description, Ann, it does sound like the board is not operating properly. This could be due to an issue with the board not getting the correct voltage or with the board itself, like Tim mentioned. We recommend using the ASAP approach, and that's always start at power. Okay, make sure that the board is getting the correct voltage from the power supply. And you can see our post and video on checking a classic power supply, Tim, for more information. Now, we should mention that if you are having power issues, you can pick up a power supply conversion kit from Arcade Shop. So that's arcadeshop.com. And Tim, basically what this does is this allows you to use a switching power supply in a in this cabinet okay which is very important because initially this cabinet i think just used a transformer and it converted the um, voltage at the board level just like a pac-man cabinet but with this kit tim this allows it to send dc voltage so you don't have to worry about the ac voltage burning up the pins on the edge connector which is a very common problem with galaxians and and pac-mans and things like that correct Correct. So, um, so if you don't know what we're talking about, Ann, we can we can explain a little bit more. But um, basically, um, the like games like Galaxian and Pac-Man, they have a transformer down at the bottom that sends like seven volts AC to the board, and then the board has a circuit on it that switches that AC voltage to five volts DC. So when we install the switching power supply, instead of sending the AC voltage, it just sends the 5 volts DC so that we don't have to switch the voltage at the board level. And Tim, that solves a lot of problems in a lot of cases, correct? A lot of problems. Yeah, I mean, it's basically, and Tim has, has um, made the illustration that it's kind of like taking a 1980s Pontiac and putting a, 2000, or a 2020 um, engine in it, right? Right. It may, it'll still look old, but it'll run a lot better. Exactly, and so having a switching power supply in there will make the game more reliable going forward. And so if you're having problems with the power supply, you may consider going with the power supply conversion kit from Arcade Shop. Tim, I don't think it's very expensive. I think it's around the $50 mark, maybe with some tax and things on there. But um, it is definitely worth it if you're going to keep the game for a while because it will ensure that the board is getting really good voltage. Now, Tim, something I didn't put on the slide that I want to talk to you about is that she does hear that high-pitched squeal coming from her monitor, but we really can't test the monitor because we're not sure if the board is working. But there is something we can do to just see at least if the monitor is getting power, correct? Even though we're not getting a signal from the board. That's correct. So what is that? What can we do in order to just check the monitor? Well, you got um, you you will see something on the screen. You can turn up the brightness or something to see if the monitor is actually coming on. Um, there's a you know, there's a couple other things that we could do too without getting too technical. But if the neck is glowing, uh, you see some what the neck of the monitor. In other words, where the tube and the chassis meet uh, forms a neck. And if you see that glowing, uh, you see, turn up your brightness, see that the screen is white or something, you know that you're getting power there. The problem is probably not there. Now, if it was the monitor, you would hear the game playing uh, and be able to coin it up and everything. You just wouldn't have a picture. That's what we call playing blind. Those are a couple things that we look at or we ask that question back a lot of time. She just hears the monitor. She doesn't hear any gameplay something like that so it's probably a good sign that it's not her monitor right and the thing that i was alluding to of course tim was turning up the brightness so when we turn up the brightness on the arcade monitor we should get a white screen even if we don't have a signal getting to the monitor we should still get kind of a white square on the screen and so that will at least let you know that the monitor is powered up and on correct tim if we get that white screen right Agreed. So it's a great way to test your monitor without having the board hooked up to it. That at least gives you an idea of if we are getting power to it and it's working properly. But based on the way you've described the problem, man, it does sound more like either board power supply issue. So like we talked about, always start at power. Trace the power coming in from the wall 
all the way through to the board. Make sure that you're getting power all the way through. And Tim, our video and post on checking a classic power supply on our website should help her out a ton with that. Anything else with her uh, with her issue before we move on, Tim? No, I don't believe so. But um, anyway, good luck to her. And uh, of course, we tackle this question and even further questions that people back up on all the time. Absolutely. So if you need additional help, again, questions at arcaderepairtips.com. Send us an email and let us know. Okay, Tim, I've got one more here before we get into kind of our arcade repair discussion, and it's from Sean. So let's go ahead and uh, read off Sean's question here. And he says, I'm trying to find out how to install an RGP to, RGB to VGA board in my Miss Pac-Man arcade. Now, Tim, this is very common when people want to replace the monitor that's in their cabinet now with like a computer style monitor, correct? Right. So um, this happens a lot. People um, people have a monitor go out. Instead of trying to fix it, they decide that they want to go with a maybe off-the-shelf LCD computer monitor. And so that in that case, you need a way to convert the signal that's coming from the Pac-Man board to a VGA plug so that you can plug in the monitor. And so in Sean's case here, how can he go about doing that? Well... You know, most people think that when they open it up, I know the first time I looked at an arcade game, I thought, well, there's a TV in here. It is a TV, too, but the chassis is what makes it more for video games and has certain hookups and stuff. So the same thing uh, with this is that we're assuming you want to put a new TV or an LCD screen in there. You're going to need some kind of conversion board, but... What we prefer is there are actually LCDs made for arcade games, like at Holland Computers and other places that sell them, that already have those conversions done for you so that you don't need to uh, have an additional board. Correct. And, and Tim, that's what we recommend. We, well, we call it a commercial grade, arcade quality LCD. I know it's very tempting, guys, to buy an off-the-shelf LCD monitor and put it in there, but I promise you, personal experience, it's a lot better if you will buy a commercial grade, arcade quality LCD, Tim, that's made to go in an arcade cabinet. The quality is, I mean, night and day, just way better quality. Plus, these monitors already have um, the capability to take that 15 kilohertz signal from the Pac-Man board directly, which means you don't have to mess with the conversion board, right, Tim? That's correct. So, and that conversion board can be quite a headache, but Tim, we're not going to rule out the conversion board. It's still a cheap way to get your arcade game working. So let's go ahead and show this slide here addressing Sean's question. So first off, we assume that you want to do this because you're replacing your arcade monitor with a computer monitor. Okay, now, Tim, we always want to encourage people to repair your original monitor if you can, right? Sure. And just like we talked about in the first question, you can always send that monitor chassis off for repair even if you don't know how to do it yourself. Tim, it's usually just a bit cheaper to get your monitor repaired than it is to install a new monitor, correct? Most of the time it is. So, Half the part. Right, and plus you get to keep the CRT in there. And Tim, we're still kind of fond of, of CRT monitors, correct? Yes, even though an LCD does look good, sometimes it almost looks too good. We like the grainy kind of look of a classic game that's what it reminds us of. It can almost make those games look too good, not kind of what we remember. Right, exactly. And so we really do like uh, CRT monitors just because they remind us probably more of our childhood, Tim, and how the game played when I was a kid. And so in most cases, we're always going to encourage you to repair your original monitor. Our second choice would be to replace it with a commercial grade arcade quality LCD like we talked about before. Right, Tim? Right. So that would be our second choice. So first choice, try repairing your original monitor. Second choice, go commercial grade arcade quality LCD. And third choice would be to do the conversion board with a computer monitor route. So let's talk about the third choice now, Tim, now that we've got the other two out of the way. The wiring is pretty simple. You just match the wires um, on the included harness with the video conversion board with the wires coming from your game board, Tim. And these wires are the same wires that you should be familiar with. There's a red, there's a green, there's a blue, there's a ground, and typically a sink. There may be two sinks, depending on which game you have. So um, JAMA uses composite negative sink. And so I believe these converter boards also use composite negative sink. And so you need to make sure that you're hooking up 
the correct sink when you hook up these conversion boards. And Tim, the manual for the conversion board will say what kind of sink it's looking for. But like I said, composite negative sink is very, very common across the board. So make sure that you're hooking up the correct sink wire. But all you have to do is just splice those wires together, Tim, just connect them together. So connect the, the, the red wire that comes from the board for video to the red wire that connects to the converter board, the blue wire to the blue wire, the green wire to the green wire, the black wire to the black wire, that's usually ground, and the white wire to whatever sync wires that you need to connect it to, and you should be in good shape. Then you plug your computer monitor to the VGA port on the converter board, and it should work. Now. With that said, there may be some tweaking required to get it to work properly. There are some adjustments on the board. There are There's an on-screen display uh, that you may have to tweak to move right or left or to, to dial in the sink. But um, for the most part, um, most of the ones we've hooked up, Tim, just work right off the bat, right? Correct. They may require some tweaking. So like the monitor may be, the picture may be too over to the left or too over to the right, or there may be a little sink issue or something, but there are adjustments on the converter board to fix that. So uh, Tim, by far the converter board with a computer monitor is probably the cheapest option. Like I said, monitor repair can be about the same price. So if you want to repair what you have, it can be around the same. But, uh, but I understand why it's so appealing because people like the price of it. But really, guys, if you want the real, true arcade experience, we do think a CRT is the best bet or going with a commercial-grade arcade-quality LCD. Tim, is there anything else that you have here for Sean before we wrap up his question? No, I don't think so. We covered that one pretty good, I, I believe. Sounds good. So, Sean, hopefully answers your question, and good luck getting that monitor and your Miss Pac-Man back up and running, regardless of which, which method you go with. But again, don't be scared to try your own repair on your monitor either, Tim. That's, it can be done. There's a lot of helpful guides out there, and we can help you as well if you'll email us with pictures of it. We can help you identify some issues. Questions at ArcadeRepairTips.com if you need additional help. Okay, Tim, now this is, this is the question that I've been waiting for. Uh, we hyped this up okay. to a lot of our audience this month on our live show episode that we did. And I, this is this may be one of my favorite favorite uh, questions of all time. And it's even got a component for you guys to share what you would do as well. So, uh, Tim, are you ready for this? I just got to ask you, are you okay. ready for this? Sure. Okay, you're ready. Okay, you okay. sure? Are you sure? Stand it. Okay. I've been waiting. Okay, there you go. Can't stand it. I like it. I like it. Okay, so here we go. So Tim, this is our discussion question for this seminar. And the question is, which project would you tackle first and why? So let's say you have these four games with these four issues. Okay, you have a Tron with a power supply issue. You've got okay. a Donkey Kong that resets shortly after you try to start a game. So you, you start the game, maybe lasts a second or two, then resets. A Tempest okay. that's playing blind or a Dragon's okay. Lair that's missing its laser disc player. Okay, so those are your four, your four. You have to pick which one would you tackle first, okay? So let, let me go over those again. A Tron with a power supply issue. A Donkey Kong that resets shortly after you try to start a game. A Tempest that's playing blind. Or a Dragon's Lair that's missing its laser disc player. So Tim, um, let's hear okay. what you think. Which okay. one would you tackle first? Well, um, that's a, this is a tough question because I would love to play all these games, but for some reason I think I would tap, tackle the Tempest first um, because I want to get it up and playing first would be the only reason. So you're, you're more partial um, to which game you want to play first, correct? Yeah, I think that's what I would go by. The, none of them seem any harder than the other issues. Except for maybe the Dragon Slayer, that sounds like that could get into a little lengthy uh, conversion or something, or finding a, that sounds like that could be difficult because we've had that problem. Right. Uh, the problem with a power issue, uh, that conversion kit that we talked about from Arcade Shop would take care of that. Probably could be one of the quickest fixes unless the Donkey Kong just needs uh, some kind of adjustment. Uh, I would think the Tron wouldn't take very long to fix, neither would the Tempest. So maybe I'm just going with the one that I think I could fix the quickest so I could play the game. So it's fine that you said the Tempest, because to me the Tempest would have been probably the last one on the list. And the reason why is because vector monitors are definitely not my expertise. And so when you're going with a color vector monitor like what's in Tempest, 
I mean, I think I could tackle it. I could probably figure it out, but it probably wouldn't be my choice of easiest for repair. So I would probably put it down the list. A Tron with a power supply issue, that's got the MCR type boards in it, Tim. And like you mentioned, there are conversion kits for those. There's a whole MCR replacement board now available that you can get even. So even if you can't repair it, uh, you could do that. But repairing that's not bad either. And so you could probably repair that pretty quickly. The Donkey Kong that resets, um, Tim, that's a pretty common problem. I, we've seen that in several Donkey Kongs. So I actually think I could fix that probably the fastest out of the bunch, to be honest with you. So now okay. the Dragon's Lair, I'm with you, is a little on the tricky side because um, laser disc players are tough. But Tim, they have a conversion kit now that can convert the laser disc player to like an SD card, a, a little board that simulates the laser disc with an SD card. So um, personally, I think I could. I did this not by which game I wanted to play first, but by which one I thought I could fix the fastest. And I determined okay. that the Donkey Kong would be the one I could probably fix the fastest. And so I went with the Donkey Kong because I felt like I could get it up quickly and start playing it immediately. So my order, though, I went ahead and did an order for this, would have been Donkey Kong, Tron, and I would be mixed on Dragon's Lair or Tempest, but I'd probably go Dragon's Lair, then Tempest. So your first was my last, <laughs> um, as far as that is concerned. Now, Tim, uh, what about the rest of your order? So if you have Tempest first, where would you put the rest? Tempest, Tron, Donkey Kong, Dragon's Lair. Okay, so you had the Dragon's Lair. I think we both agree that the Dragon's Lair was kind of a tricky one. The Donkey Kong could turn into more of a tricky one because, I mean, anytime you're dealing with board reset issues, um, you could actually have a board issue. But a lot of times it's a power supply issue when it's resets. Not always, but, I mean, it can be a power supply issue. Um, but there's also some, some uh, board things that um, do that that are pretty easy to solve as well in Donkey Kong, which is why I felt like the Donkey Kong could be solved fairly quickly. But um, I think it's interesting that... That both of us kind of came up with a different order of our four and a different one at the top so um but guys what we want to encourage you to do is to send us which one you would do so tim i'm going to go ahead and throw these back up on the screen so again so which project would you tackle first and why and i'm going to read them again here it's the tron with the power supply issue the donkey kong that resets shortly after you try to start a game the tempest that's playing blind or the Dragon's Lair that's missing its Laserdisc player. And if you just want to send us an order of how you would tackle them, like, so my order, of course, was 2, 1, 4, 3. Uh, if you want to just send us those numbers, that'd be great. Or if you want to send us, you know, it would be Tron first, and this is why, and then it'd be this next, and this is why, we will take that as well. But um, we'd love to hear what you guys think of this and which one you would tackle first, because I think this is a super interesting question. Uh, because it really gets down to, I mean, some people may be like, oh, I'm going to tackle the Tron first, Tim, because Tron's my favorite game, and I don't really want to play that one. Or um, Dragon's Lair is my favorite game, and so I'm going to do that first. Or I think I can fix the Tron the fastest, so I'm going to go with the Tron. So there's a lot of different ways to kind of approach uh, this project list. And so the question is, how do you approach it? Let us know by writing us at questions at arcaderepairtips.com. So there you go. Great stuff, Tim. I, I, well, I think I've wrapped it up here as far as um, all of the uh, different uh, discussion and questions and things go. But I will put in another plug for our website, Tim. You guys can check us out at ArcadeRepairTips.com. We have a lot of uh, great information about Arcade Repair there, Tim. Tim, is there anything you want to mention while, we, uh, while we're wrapping it up here at the end of the show? Know that if you've never seen our live show, you kind of get a little bit of the format that we use. Uh, we also have some other discussion topics. We even debate sometimes. Uh, we also have our after show, which where we talk about a lot of general topics. So um, people seem to really enjoy that. We'd love to, if you haven't subscribed to our channel, we'd love for you to subscribe. If there's anything you'd like to see, please uh, let us know if we can do or improve anything. Um, we're pretty big, big boys and we can handle it. If there's something that, um, uh, we ever present any information our goal has always been to share the knowledge that we've learned and to learn more ourselves by uh, investigating and doing those things and answering these questions absolutely tim our goal here at arcade repair tips is to help people fix games and i think we've talked about that a lot um we're all about helping people fix games but tim really what we're all about is helping people and so we want to be able to help you if you've got different issues going on you know um, please feel free to email us at questions at arcade repair tips.com and we would love to help you out with that like tim mentioned we have a live show we do that on the first thursday night of every month at 5 30 p.m. Central Time. And so, Tim, uh, the cool thing about that, though, Tim, is not only is it just you and me, but we also have an entire live chat of people. And, Tim, our live chats are always so lively, aren't they? 
Yes. So very. <laughs> so you can come join us with two hundred of our closest friends during one of our live shows, which we uh, we love to do. And Tim, you can answer. You can ask questions there as well. So if you have a question and you don't really want to send it to us via email, and you just like to uh, tune in and watch a live show, you can do that and ask us a good question there as well. Tim, we're on Twitter. We're on Facebook. You can find us on Twitter. Twitter.arcaderepairtips.com. Facebook.arcaderepairtips.com. And Tim, our social media team really just um, Mark and Louie, they're always posting news stories about arcade games. So even if you're not into arcade repair, if you're just interested in arcades as a subject, then make sure that you sign up for our, our Facebook or our Twitter pages because there you will you'll find out all the latest news about arcade repair. Tim, this month we had stories concerning Chuck E. Cheese, of course, Arcade One Up, and uh, some of the different pro new products they're releasing, but there's a lot of great information. New pinball releases, for those of you guys who are wondering about the new pinball releases, Tim, uh, we always have a lot of great information there. So if you want to stay on the cutting edge of arcade-related news, make sure that you sign up for our Facebook page or our Twitter feed. So there you go. Uh, Tim, is there anything else you want to say before we wrap it up? No, we appreciate the opportunity to do this virtual uh, seminar. Um, we are always open to speak at seminars and do some on-the-site training. Uh, you can feel free to contact us about that anytime. Sounds good. And we also want to thank uh, Preston, Patrick, Shannon, and all of the people involved with the Southern Fried Gaming Expo. And Tim, we were so sad to hear that they had to um, shut it down this year, but we're so excited that they were able to do this virtually and that we were able to do a virtual seminar. And it is just, uh, it's been a great time. We're so glad that you joined us for that. And make sure that you uh, visit our website, check us out sometime, and uh, and send us your arcade repair related, uh, arcade repair questions uh, anytime at questions at arcaderepairtips.com. Tim, we're going to go ahead and close up the seminar for tonight. We want to also make sure that all of you guys are safe. We're, we're praying for safety for you and your family. You guys are in our thoughts. And uh, just remember to social distance, you know, wear your mask. Um, do, do your part to hopefully help us get past this pandemic so we can all get back to normal very soon, Tim. And support arcades that are having a hard time through this pandemic, Tim. There are lots of arcades that are really suffering because they haven't been able to open through all this. Consider buying a shirt or buying something else uh, to help these arcades out because, guys, they need it. If you want to see arcade games around in the future, try to support them. So, Tim, let's wrap it up. Guys, thank you for watching the Southern Fried Gaming Expo seminar presented by Arcade Repair Tips. And remember here at Arcade Repair Tips, when we fix the game, we play the game. Yep, Take play. care, everybody, and hopefully we'll see you sometime on our website at ArcadeRepairTips.com. Take care and have a great night.